Alors, alors. 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 Five minutes. I, I see. I need to call. I give you a brief introduction. Oh, thank and you. Then I'll call. Yeah, you yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah, I'll go back. Okay. <laughs> thank you very much. As we are about to begin, I would like to call everyone to be in Hall 1.
Ladies and gentlemen, hope you had a good lunch. I would like to welcome you all uh, in this third keynote address session. Today we have Professor Dr. Susumo Kono all the way from Tokyo as a keynote speaker. Professor Kono, after graduating in civil engineering, was enrolled in the Department of Civil Engineering, University of Illinois at Champaign-Urbana. He received his PhD degree from the same university in year 1995. He started his academic career in 1989 as a research assistant at University of Washington, Seattle, while being involved in research on concrete cracking with FEM programs. His research works mainly focus on nonlinear modeling of RC members. Professor Kono's primary research areas incorporate the experimental investigation of rainforest and pre-stress precast concrete structural system subjected to earthquake loadings. Moreover, his interest lies in the performance-based design of reinforced concrete damage control or zero damage design using pre-stressed precast concrete. However, he is currently developing interest in damage evaluation, control of RC structures to improve the performance-based design development of damage controlling systems using pre-stress, precast concrete technology and study on pile and pile, pile foundation. So without further delay, let's wel welcome Professor Kono with huge round of applause to deliver keynote on resiliency of reinforced concrete buildings, Japanese efforts and struggles. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Ah, I see. Okay, thank you. Pointer. It seems it's not now. That, 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 that's fine, that's fine. Yeah, let's get started. <laughs> I can do it without it. Okay, and so thank you very much for coming and joining this like a keynote lecture. I would like to really thank you for the organizers and uh, all the help from the Nepalese and the chairperson and also the Prem Maski here who is a good friend of mine and uh, all the st his students. Oh, thank you very much. Yes. So this is just a talk about how we are kind of making an effort. And there's no like an end story. We are still making lots of effort and struggling. And that's how we like to talk about it. And the first, it's a really nice like a <laughs> introduction. And the reinforced concrete in the Japan, and the we, we are making like a very high rise building right now. More than like a 20 stories. And it started from the 87. Th those time, like a uh, concrete strength, we call it like F prime C, like a 36 megapascal. Those days, that was a high strength concrete. And then the currently, what we, we are using is 150, 200. And one of the company from the Taisei Corporation, they are using like a 250 megapascal, which is almost like a steel. And then they combine like a base isolation and also damping system with the high strength concrete and to make the high rise building. And those like uh, comfort of the reinforced concrete building is really good. And those are based on the very, very fundamental researches conducted on the 80s and 90s. And those are the new RC project, new reinforced concrete structural member project. And then the, those things, the concrete itself and also the steel sometimes like a steel is 785 megapascal, and then the 1285 megapascal. And those can be used for the shear rebars, for example. And then also the mechanical joint, and then another technology is a precast. And uh, you need a lot of quality control to make this one. And so 
the difficult thing is like a beam column joint portion. And so you can make it in the factory and then just ship it to the place. And then you construct them. And then the, some of the people said, like, what is the tolerance of this? And I talked to the constructor. They said, like, it's only like a five mil. And uh, if the difference is more than five mil, it doesn't go to the sleeve. Okay, so th those are really uh, tight tolerance. And then the, like a core wall is reinforced concrete, outside is something else, and they connect with the dampers and the base isolation. If you combine them, you can make a really high-rise buildings. And so those are kind of fancy part of what's going on in Japan. And then the, what is the design procedure we are taking? Not only for those like high scrapers, but also the mm, conventional type of the buildings. And uh, the today's talk, I'm going to make is only for the conventional things because which is governing the damage after the earthquake, not the high scrapers. High scrapers is something here, and mostly they are reviewed by the like a peer review, and then the, mostly they are doing the nonlinear dynamic analysis, which not many people knows what's going on, and it's really hard to validate. And uh, yesterday I was in the session, and then some people are making the numerical analysis uh, presentation, and then uh, some people ask, raise the question, and uh, how do you validate them? That's a very important portion of our engineering society. But, but, but forget about this one. And this is something that for the normal, like a condo or the office building, which is normally we, we take it like a less than 60 meters. And then we changed the design code at 81 because of the lots of earthquake damage happened to the reinforced concrete buildings, especially. And then the, um, until 81, everything was working stress design. And then the eight, after 81, what we make was like a first level and second level. And the first level was still the working stress design based on the point to base shear coefficient. And then the second level is ultimate force. And how much lateral carrying capacity do you have for your like, uh, buildings? And then depending on the strength or stiffness, we separate it into three parts, root one, root two, root three. And so those are like, uh, this is very stiff, this is very soft, and then this is intermediate. And this is a little bit like hard to see. And so if you do this, Mostly this is the walls, lots of walls, lots of columns, and then it's your structure is stiff and uh, strong. And so you don't have to care much about ductility. But e your building is just made of a beam and columns. It's going to be softer and then deflex more. And so you need to design for the ductility. And those things, like uh, you need to count on the R factor, for example. We, we don't use R, but instead the invert of the R is DS. And so we call it DS. And uh, here, for example, I was making a presentation yesterday. And wha what number do you use? We use like a 0.55 for this building. <laughs> for, sorry, for this. Okay. So re reinforced concrete shovels, if you use them. And then the R is about 2. And if you make an invert, that makes the 0.55, and so it's really high. And also, the, for all of this, it's not based on the dynamic analysis. We start for this portion for the 1.0 G of the base shear. Time is 0.55 means like uh, your buildings need to be sustained like a 55% of the lateral load. Tho those are very high value. If you use like frame buildings for the reinforced concrete, 0.3, okay, and so it's m difference is large. If your building is really tactile, and then you need to be really like uh, do the tactile system, and those tactile design is necessary. But instead, you can save a lot of money because the uh, input force is m two times different. And so the same figure, and then uh, what's happened for the. This doesn't make any like a earthquake resistant. And so the, this is kind of requirement. And the, this is your performance line. 
And if you make the walls or lots of columns, and then it's really stiff, and then it crosses this red line, and then you'll be safe. And so you're resisting the uh, earthquake load by your strength. Okay? And this one is like a frame buildings. You're resisting the seismic force by like uh, energy consumption mostly by making yourself like a nonlinear range. And usually nonlinear range is plastic, non-elastic. That means like a, you are damaging yourself to absorb the energy. But that, that, that's how like a resistant R factor works. And so if you use large R factor, you can reduce the seismic force but you're damaging yourself very badly. If you use this one, yeah, it's costly, but the damage should be really less. Okay? So th and this concept can be used for the new building construction and also the seismic reservoir. And so if your existing building is this low, and so strength is low, ductility is not enough, then you should think about you go this way or that way. And uh, like a FRP, seismic retrofit, or jacketing, those are going this way. And th there are lots of like a development of using FRP or not necessarily the FRP, but the ductile behavior. Th that's fine, that's fine, but uh, you also need to pay after the earthquake. Probably it's going to be damaged. And for, for example, this is something like I took from the somebody else's like a thesis. And then the, you have a building, and then you assume this like a distribution. And then you do the pushover analysis. And then here's a load, and then drift. And this is like a base shear coefficient. And in, J in Japan, like a first, first level design based on the point two of the base shear coefficient. And then under this condition, your member should be, all the stresses need to be less than the yielding or some kind of a working stress level. And the steel is yielding and the concrete is two thirds of F prime C. Okay. And then depending on the, your type of the building, in this case, uh, let's assume like a, this is a frame building and so lots of columns and beams. And then your R factor is three, okay. or 0 0.33, 3 3.3, and so it should be like a, this. The base share, I say like 1.0 is the uh, original thing for the second level design, times like a DS, or 1.0G times or divided by R. Uh, in this case, your building needs to be larger than this one, and so this building is clear. This is larger than the second level design point three, and so uh, in, in Japan, your building is okay. You can build it, so uh, th that works that way. Okay, but the, the level of this one, point two or point three or point three, point two and point fifty five, the level of those things is set by the government because that determines the cost of the building, and that's the cost of the society you're paying. If you obviously, if you raise these numbers, the buildings get stronger, stiffer. But uh, probably you need to invest invest more money. And uh, I'm not sure, like uh, in this country or other countries, if you do the push-up analysis and then see the level of this one, it's not as high as this one. Uh, I'm sure, like Japan is one of the country using a very high seismic lateral loading to design the ultimate condition. And then how do they work in? And so I'm taking a look at the, some photos. This is 95 COVID. And what we learn is the first story collapse. Okay. And here and there and everywhere. And the 95, the lesson was like a soft story collapse. And I said like uh, those, like a two level of the design code was set in the 81. And uh, buildings before the 81, they just think about the working stress and uh, 0.2G or something. And so all of them fail <laughs> and, uh, uh, at the ultimate condition. 
But even the building designed or built after the 81 still collapsed. Uh, so uh, the new design code is not working for the soft stories. Uh, so that, that's one of the things we learned. And then most of the time, like if you don't have a first story, soft first story, the building is stand, standing okay. But if you have a soft story like this one, even if you design the building based on the code in 81, it didn't work well. And uh, from Kobe, like a first story, soft story didn't work very well. And also the, this eccentricity, they cause the torsional effect. Uh, these are very basic things. And probably the, all the textbook and the freshman or sophomore, they list like you shouldn't do it <laughs> or we got to avoid it. But in the practical sense, this is very important factor for the buildings because you need a, a car space, car parking spaces or anything. And so uh, people are building the like, uh, buildings for the, some kind of function. And so the engineers need to work <laughs> how to solve these things or how to solve these things, okay? And then another lesson from the 95 Kobe earthquake. This is the code. Year of the code 71 is a slight modification for the shear failure of the column, or especially the short column. 81 is a major difference. So we set up the sec two level of the design. And then after 81. And then here is the damage status, damage states, and the number of the buildings. And obviously you can see this, lots of damages. And so if the building was built or designed before the 71, definitely the lots of buildings would get damaged because they never designed for the ultimate condition. And it, it, this is about the same. But, it, but if you see this line, if you cross this line, so building after the earthquake, I'm sorry, the 81 code, it's not zero. <laughs> Some of the buildings get damaged, but still the number decreased dramatically. And so we kind of think like, a, oh, okay, new building code is kind of functioning, okay. And also these things, so buildings before, especially 81 code, needs to be retrofitted. And so seismic evaluation, seismic retrofit is also the big task for the engineering society because you cannot demolish them all. You got to some, somehow you keep using them. And so you need to do something for these buildings. And then the 2011 Tohoku earthquake, uh, still after like uh, almost 12 years or 15 years after the Kobe earthquake, uh, we learned something from Kobe, but still the damage is here. And then the, this is the same for the Kobe, but we, we reinstating it. And so the current codes or practices do not guarantee the resiliency of building. That means it, doesn't, it didn't fail. The building was performed okay if you design it based on the 81 new code, but still it didn't function after the earthquake because of the small damage to the non-structural members especially. And then the new demand from the society is, oh, I want to use the building as before. Before and after should be the same. And the function of the building should be like uh, working as before. But previously, like uh, especially the 81 code, uh, people putting, putting so much effort for the safety. Even after the 81, the one of the majority of the code purpose is the safety issues. And so those secondary, like uh, lateral load carrying capacity stuff, th that worked very well. And then the, this is some typical damages in the 2011 Tohoku earthquake. This is non-structural members. Okay. And so yesterday I also talked, like it uh, used to be, if you get this and then the engineering like a structural engineer comes to the building and to the owner, uh, oh, the, your building behaved very fantastically. Uh, there's no damage. But there's damage, but uh, what do you mean? Well, no damage to the structural members. 
But uh, people don't understand. Oh, this, this is damage itself. And how do you explain? Oh, the structure engineer only cares about the structure members. <laughs> and we don't care about the non-structure things. But for the people living there, or owners, the damage is damage. It's the same. You need to pay money to re fix it. And then the most recently in the urban earthquake, these things happen a lot, and then these stop the function of the buildings. And then sometimes you need to demolish the building because of those things. And so non-structural thing is not non-structural at all. It's a very important factor to think about for the engineers. And this is something else. We use a, like a school gymnasium, especially the middle school, elementary school, for the refugees after the earthquake. But and then the, the, those ceiling is uh, like a space truss or something. They're sitting on the concrete column. This connection is really poorly uh, designed. We, we, we believe, we means like uh, I'm kind of doing lots of experiment on the reinforced concrete. And so we do not do the, I don't do the steel. And steel people don't know very much, but they designed this part. And so I just blame like, oh, they did a really lousy design. Uh, they don't know how to design the, uh, this portion. They don't even provide the sherry bars. They just put the anchor bars. And so they, they lots of like, uh, things fail. If you have this, you cannot use a gymnasium as a refugee. You need to totally shut down the buildings. Okay? And another thing is a pile. And uh, not many th like uh, collapse didn't happen for the building. Even uh, these things have been the problem for long years, but sometimes like uh, engineers are hiding <laughs> or it's not exposed to the uh, general public, and so people didn't know. And uh, if you don't know the how bad it is, like a uh, building, co like a tilt, and then engineers come, oh, nothing wrong about your superstructure. Uh, might be something's wrong, but it's cost a lot of money to dig and inspect it. Mm, how would you like to do? And then uh, owners, yeah, just forget about it, and then we just keep using. <laughs> That's one way. And then the other side is like, uh, yeah, we just dig it and then and see what's wrong, wrong, wrong. But sometimes you find this. And it's really hard to fix it. Okay. And so the, these thi three things is kind of only the one f like uh, damage to the structure members or non-structure members. But even like one of them happened to the structure, and then your buildings need to shut down. <laughs> that, so these the things, the resilience can be severely hampered, even from the single factor. Though those are the things. And so we're kind of gradually moving from the safety issues to the resilience issues. And so safety issues in Japan, we are kind of solving, okay, maybe 80%, 85%, not, uh, not 100%. But people's interest is moving since like, uh, your building is standing okay. And so the safety is guaranteed. And the next thing is, Oh, I want to keep using my structure, but if these things happen, and then you cannot. And so th this is a very important issue since like an 11 earthquake. And then Kumamoto is the most recent one, the major one. The similar things, the, the resilience is very important. And safety is still the most critical issue for sure. And so I don't deny anything about like, a, yeah, forget about uh, those safety issues. We just concentrate on the uh, resiliency. That shouldn't be done. Still, the safety is important. In addition to that, you need to put this resiliency to your structure. That's the task for the engineers or researchers. Okay. Yeah, maybe you know um, lots of them, I just skip them, and still this first story fail. Okay? The same. And this, this portion is enlarged here, and uh, you, you have a failure because of the soft story at the first story. And this one is also they by using this story, first story as a parking garage, and then they lost this story completely. Like this. The same building they lost this like a uh, third floor or fourth floor 
And then the Kumamoto also, yeah, one of the typical things is the failure of the soft story, but uh, these things is standing okay. But if you get closer and there's some damage, and then here you go, and non structure member was damaged. And uh, y you cannot use your building if you once you get this one. And so th th these are very important things. And so I keep saying the same stuff. And the safety is first, but the resiliency is also equally important these days. And so, uh, yeah, let's skip these things. And I said like 81 code is working okay, but it's not perfect. And so we still need to keep like uh, <laughs> fixing the flaws or uh, improving somehow. And one of the things is a soft story. Okay. And uh, another thing is uh, like a limitation of the drift. Interstory drift needs to be limited to avoid the damage to the non structure member. Especially the non structure member, sometimes they get damaged due to the interstory drift. And sometimes damaged by the <laughs> accelerations. And uh, th th those things need, need to be stopped. Okay. This is too small to read. There is uh, some earthquake, earthquake in like uh, 78, 80, some nine, this is 95. And then every time there is an earthquake, there is uh, some revision to the code or standards. It's everywhere the same. Even here in Nepal or Chile, US, US or Taiwan, whatever, y if you have uh, like a seismic code, they kind of evolving the code after the earthquake. So uh, in a sense, the government or structural engineer do not work hard if the something hap doesn't happen. <laughs> it's only <laughs> we work after the earthquake. Okay. And so uh, even the 81 earth those code, that was caused by the 80, 78 earthquake or 68. Those things smashed the concrete buildings. And that's why we thought, oh, we need to revise the code from the, the fundamentally. And those things happen. And also the seismic retrofit, seismic evaluation, this was set after the 95 earthquake by looking at the damage. Yeah, let's skip this one. The, I got it from uh, my friend Ken Elwood in the University of Auckland. And uh, th their view is very interesting too, but uh, maybe we, we have a chance to come back. But they're also saying, th 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 they're nice enough to say, like uh, Japan is a little bit better in the resilience. I, I'm not so sure, but the thing is, they are also looking at the resilience very, very like, uh, closely. That's one of the important issues for the US, New Zealand, or Canada, or everywhere in the seismic country on the uh, Pacific Rim. More background. This is New Zealand before the earthquake, Christchurch earthquake. There are lots of buildings, and all, many of them are gone after the earthquake, like this. They didn't collapse. Only like a few of them collapsed. Uh, some of them damaged, but they demolished them because they didn't like the damaged building. And also they have like a, the insurance policies to cover the demolishing. But the society cannot tolerate the resist those damaged buildings anymore. That's very clear from this. And also, right now, uh, I got it from uh, Stefano. The Christchurch is kind of sad. It's not uh, old like uh, Christchurch anymore. It's very uh, different. But they're also struggling hard how to revive their town. Here is your like a uh, Golka earthquake. You also, I I feel the same way. This building is standing okay or with, without any damage, but if you get closer, the non-structural like a brick wall is coming out or have a like cracking. So you also have the similar problem. This, right? And then, uh, wha then what we are doing in, in my university or research group or in Japan, for example. And uh, yesterday I talked about this one. And so this is specimen, okay? 
So here is the people, and this is five-story building. We tested it in the BRI. BRI is a building research institute. It's a public university, uh, a public research institute in Japan. And then they built it, and they wanted to see the function of the, this like a side wall, some wall, and some like a slit. But we were interested in the cracking. Well, I talked about this one yesterday, and so I just skip it. <laughs> okay, and uh, this is FEM analysis, and so the important thing is how you like uh, predict the crack width, length, spacing of the residual crack residual crack width. Uh, residual is very important issue because people are interested in the cracking after the earthquake, <laughs> not when you're shaking. <laughs> And so let's skip this one. And oh, I, we also did the, some component test. And this, this is a kind of isolated wall, and then we loaded it. And then this is a shear failure type. If you add the wall backside, and then wall, the cracking is a little bit better, but still you have a cracking. Another stuff I like to talk a little bit about is the rocking system. And the rocking system is proposed by the uh, Nigel, Nigel Priestry. And uh, he was that time like a professor at the USC San Diego, okay, UC San Diego, sorry. And they proposed some like a rocking system. And so this is precast company post tension. <laughs> and so it's like a post tension in the middle. And then the outside, they put the mild rebars. And these days, they, they've been like uh, working in the New Zealand and the US, and uh, these days they put this like uh, dampers or uh, energy dissipators outside so that you can switch them, like a plug and play. After the earthquake, if your dampers or mild steel get damaged, you can replace it if you have it outside. But uh, anyway, what's happening is this pre stressing tendons give you the nonlinear, like a uh, Nonlinear, but still the elastic behavior. And then the, these mild rebars or dampers give the energy dissipation. If you combine them, this is flag shape. M many people know of this. And the good thing is you can absorb the energy. And so your like, uh, displacement or uh, acceleration is decreased. And then after the earthquake, what happened is you have zero displacement, almost zero, <laughs> but I say like zero displacement. That's good. You can use uh, your inner building or members as before, as nothing happened. And so this is kind of ideal things, but if you test it, you can do it. And uh, although this was tested in uh, UC San Diego, but not many buildings have been built in the United States. But instead, and uh, like a Stefano, Nigel's uh, ex-students or those group worked hard, and so a couple of buildings were built in uh, New Zealand. And so we also did it in our university. And this is reinforced concrete, and this is pre-stressed, and this is reinforced, and then uh, this is pre-stressed. Uh, and so I call it this is like a rocking system. This is conventional, like a reinforced concrete. Maybe we cannot see the dam. Oh, it's hard to see the damage. Uh, it's not set up right. And oh, and also there's a like you can put the dampers. Some of them are gone, and so this is conventional reinforced concrete, and then the, this is. The uh, precast concrete wall with pre stressing tendons. And so this pink thing is the pre stressing tendons. Those are the spring. And the spring gives you the re restoring force. And then the restoring force is not enough. And so you want uh, some dampers. And in my case, this is my damper. And then you load it like this. This is rocking system. If you don't provide the dampers, the energy dissipation is very small. But instead, uh, if you take out the load, your like, uh, load coming back here, 
sorry, the displacement. That means like a, there's no like a residual displacement, no residual crack width. And so your members seem really like healthy after the earthquake. But the, probably that when during the shaking, if the energy dissipation is this small, your shaking is large or displacement becomes large. And so you provide uh, these dampers and then you get some like a kind of uh, energy dissipation plus like a very, very small residual displacement. And so this is one of the things you can do it using the existing technology without too much effort. And uh, you're kind of using, utilizing the walls very nicely. Uh, that's, that, that's reinforced concrete. They use uh, this one, uh, even this one. Uh, they, good thing is energy dissipation is large. That's a good thing about the reinforced concrete. But uh, in the beginning, I said, this means like they are damaging themselves. That's how they absorb energy. And so after the earthquake, I think this is RC, rocking wall, rocking wall plus dampers. And uh, you see them like a cracking. This is fracture cracking because of the slit. But if you make it a rocking system, so precast plus like a PC, you don't see much cracking. And uh, I'm going to show you the enlargement of this portion. See, th there's a cracking, but the, the, the cracking is much, much less. And here is two, okay? And so it's kind of nice, nice system. Again, like a reinforced concrete, RC, RC, the, you have a, you can't avoid the cracking, or can't avoid the cr crushing of the concrete at the edge. But if you make it like a pre-stressed concrete and post-tension, and then the cracking is much, much less. And uh, this is after the one or two percent of the drift ratio. And if you make it slender, and uh, it's even better. And then the, this is what? A residual drift. If you use RC, the residual drift is large. And if you use a rocking system, it's much smaller. And then if you use a plus damper, rocking plus damper, it's intermediate, but it's much, much better than the RC. You don't see the cracking or residual drift very much. How much time do I have? <laughs> 10 more minutes, okay. The energy equivalent dumping ratio, and so this is the ratio between the your loop versus this triangle, okay? It looks like this. Again, like uh, if you provide uh, dampers, it is equivalent to the reinforced concrete members. And so your performance in, with, in, with respect to the energy dissipation could be almost like equivalent to the reinforced concrete or even better in this case. But if you just use a rocking system without the dampers, it's kind of hard. This energy dissipation is like 4%, 5%. And so uh, you need to expect large displacement and uh, accelerations. And this is something we are doing for the damage evaluation. And so I wanted to compare how the performance is for the precast post-tension members versus the reinforced concrete. And what we're using is, this is conceptual. So cracking, yielding, peak, ultimate. That's the general behavior for the reinforced concrete structures. And then if you take a look at the, their residual drift, residual crack reduce, and also the concrete stress level, pre-stressing tendon stress level, and the rebars. And uh, I'm not showing these two, only cracking. Uh, for example, like uh, residual cracking, 0.2 mil of the crack width, and the one mil, two mil, and then it's going to be like a service limit to limit state, repairability one, repairability two, and the safety limit state. You use this one to apply for your experimented like, uh, specimens. And if you summarize all those things, these are the material level. And then the service limited, repairability one, two, three, or safety. And the PS tendon, this is elastic, and the minor yielding, and the major yielding. The residual, sorry, residual drift, almost 0%, um, smaller than 25%, smaller than 5%, 4%. And then depending on the numbers, oh, my members get damaged as much as this or much this. And so my s 
one of my PhD students did this. And then comparing between the rocking walls and the rocking wall with dampers. If you put the dampers, the behavior, I said the hysteresis is better, but the damage happens a little bit earlier because the dampers is pressing the concrete. And the concrete is starting to crash. And so th th this like earlier appearance of the, this R1, R2, compared with this one, is happened because of the existence of the dampers. And so that's a penalty, but offset. But still probably th this is a good behavior. And uh, I think the reinforced concrete here. Reinforced concrete, those things, event is happening much, much quicker. As I said, like it's damaging itself. And so the cracking, crushing, or the cracking, those things happening once any one of the uh, issues happen, and then we assume, oh, you reached service limit, limit state, repair one, repair two, and safety limits. Those things happening very quickly for the small drift ratio. And so in that sense, like a damper, oh, sorry, rocking system, or rocking system with dampers functions very well. And so rocking system, I say like, a, it, it, it is good as like a strong, stiff, ductile as RC was, but it's much, much better than resilient than the RC. And uh, we also did the same thing for the, this is beam. Okay? This is almost like a real scale uh, beam. Do we need to use those like a really like advanced? For me, it's advanced system, not quite. Like if you look at the damage of the Chile, that happened in 2010, they used a lot of walls. And then the, what is the result? The, the collapsed buildings for demolished buildings, about 50, and then the buildings damaged more than three stories. Out of this number, only like a 0.3% fail, or I think this is fail or damaged. And then the, the nine story is higher, it's 0.8%. That very good. The like, seismicity was like 8.4 or something, 2010, like a Ch Chile Maule earthquake. And uh, how they did it? They use a lot of walls. It's fundamental things for the reinforced concrete people. And it's not very expensive to build a wall. Uh, they just, it, but it like, uh, if you look at these buildings, it was damaged slightly, but it basically they build everything with the wall, wall, wall. <laughs> and uh, sometimes you don't see any beams and column, just a wall plus like a flat slab. And then their design criteria is very strict for the drift ratio. Industry drift ratio is strictly limited. And so their choice of the building for this kind of building is only the wall the things. Okay, wall is the only choice. They, and they cannot use a, like a frames beam and columns, and then the drift is too large, and then the, they cannot abide by the, their regulations. But these things, it's easy to do, and then, but it's really good working against uh, things. And so even if you don't use uh, like an advanced system, like a base isolation, a rocking system, or a damping system, if you design well, uh, that's fine. In the morning, like uh, Prem talked about his keynote lecture, even uh, Mason Lee's, RC's, you need to design and then uh, construct well. If you do it well, it functions. I agree. Okay. And the summary, what does it say? We still need to explain. Uh, and so it's still we are learning. Every time the earthquake happened, something happened. And some damage happened, and then we learn. That, that's always keep doing it. And so the, we are also still learning, and sometimes we come to like Nepal after the earthquake, and we learn, and then uh, earthquake happened in Taiwan or Indonesia, I just go and take a look at damage. And so it's just a learning process, and still no like a country code is perfect. Uh, like an international collaboration, that's why it's very important, all the engineers. And the engineers need to pay attention to the meaning. They just, they just shouldn't read the code and then follow the equation. And then I follow the equation and then my duty is done. That, that, that's not, not 
good. And uh, professors or engineers, we also need to know what's happening, what's the meaning, what's the mechanism of the equations. Oh, this is pile. And I think uh, I need to wrap it up. And so I, I'm a, I do a lot of experiment. I think also the experiment is very important part of the research work. Because like, uh, these days, you can use the nonlinear finite element or whatever very easily. But how much of those things are true? How much of them are validated? And uh, every time I do the, uh, this experiment, and then I ask my students to simulate using FEM to uh, these results, the first couple of months, it doesn't work. Uh, hysteresis curve is like two times, three times different. And then after six months, they finally get agreement. <laughs> that, that, that's the range of the uh, property of the FEM. And uh, I think maybe you're getting a little bit sleepy. I think like, oh, let me show you. Like a pile. Can, can you increase the volume? You cannot do it. Like a point 0.3, this is a 110 megapascal concrete, the precast, the spun concrete. And I applied, I think it's going to break. The, the, this is pile. And they put the wee bars a little bit. And so we call, they call it, or precast concrete company says, it's ductile. And then <laughs> this is pre-stress high strength concrete pile. They don't have any rebars like the previous one. Oh. Let's see. Let me see. This is 435. Okay. Thirty percent of the actual load is applied. That is about like a four hundred tons, and then we do the pure. Th this is like a simply supported like a flexure testing, and uh, my loading system can apply like a two thousand ton compression and uh, eight hundred tons of the tension, and so we can almost like simulate the situation for this guy, but not the real scale. This is a little bit smaller, four hundred like a mill. But people didn't know like it's going to fail like this. People knew, people see it. After the earthquake, they dug, it, dug the ground and then saw the, uh, these kind of the pile, precast pile fail very badly. But they didn't know why, because they did uh, like a section analysis, fraction member, and then they showed a really nice curve. <laughs> but if you tested it, <laughs> Oh, 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 this is what, ha what happened. And also the show the, those rocking system as well. Uh, I don't do this all the time. This is tested in the E-defense. And the right-hand side is a reinforced concrete. Left-hand side, you can see the, sorry. Here's a, like a uh, load cell. And so this is pre-stress tendons sticking. And they're coming back through. And I'm going to show you the enlargement of this portion. <laughs> RC. Y you are seeing this cracking. If it is it probably it's too far for you. You see the cracking for the reinforced concrete walls, okay? And then the this is a precast post-tensioned walls. You see the lift. 
it's going to rock. And so you see the lock lift up. But the member itself is much, much better in shape. And that, 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 that's what like, we are trying to achieve. Okay. I think we need to <laughs> finish very soon. And so uh, I, do, I, sell, I do a lot of uh, experiment. And the front view is this. And sometimes I invite people. And so the front view looks really nice. But the back side, you do a lot of instrumentation. And you need to measure a lot of uh, displacement, strain gauges. And then the, this is what is happening. And I usually use, this is one channel box carries house the 50 channels. And I I'm using probably like a six here, six or seven of them. That means like a 300 channels. And my grad students put like a strain gauges. For the wall, I usually use like a 100 to 200 strain gauges. That's a quite lots of number. And then the, my consumption in the, our research group, I usually buy like a three to 4,000 strain gauges a year. That's a lot for the, the steel people don't believe it. They put only like a 10 strain gauges. And uh, my friend in the Greece, they, she said like a she buy the strain gauges by herself. The one strain gauge costs like a twenty dollars. It's a, it, like a, our price is a third, one third, but still it's a lot. And then the March fifth, uh, Prem visited our, our lab. Our lab is small, and so I cannot do the like a pile test or those huge tests. I just go outside and the BRI or companies to do the testing. And then we just do the small scale test. And uh, he was good, like, uh, kind enough to invite us uh, coming here. And then the, his students, like Nepali students, I have one later I'm going to show you. And then the rest of them, like uh, Naresh, uh, Niraj, and uh, here, the Binod, they're working for the, some, like Anil, professor from uh, Sri Lanka. And uh, this is my team, and unfortunately, he joined the maybe the, a month ago, and uh, he was not here. We are having like lunch, and uh, he was having an intensive course for the uh, Japanese class, and so he was <laughs> kind of too busy to join. But uh, we have a lot of internationals and uh, so visitors, and if you are interested in, please come and join us. And so uh, international friendship or cooperation is very important. And uh, I thanks everybody again for staying awake <laughs> after lunch. Okay.